Hi, my name is Richard Bilderbeek and I would like to redo the journal club that I presented at my research group at the 2nd of June 2022. So this journal club has already been. I just think it should be it's an it's a fun idea to put it online as well. So the article we discussed was called a Reproducible Research a Retrospective by Roger Pang and Stephanie Hicks. And I want to start with something that has always annoyed me. So there's this guy, I'll tell his name in a second, that in a scientific paper he wrote, and I think this was in Latin, I have discovered a marvelous proof to this theorem, that this margin is too narrow to contain. And I often ask myself, like, is this, as a scientist, can you do that? Um, is he a scientist? Well, in this case, it was uh, Pierre Fermat, um, and definitely was a scientist. And this is uh, the last um, the lemma theorem of of him, uh, and it's proven now. But at that time, he wrote it. He didn't have the time to write it down, and I'm annoyed by not writing down the calculation. And that's why I picked this article. So the article is about reproducible science, and I care about that. And the article is also very recent. So when I think about reproducible science, and I made this slide before I made all the others, I think about code and I talk about data. There's a third thing, however, that I completely forgot, which is just as important. It's not mentioned in the paper, and I'll clarify what I think is the, the missing third part of reproducible science. So the authors of the paper are Roger Peng, uh, here he's a statistician, he's a professor, Stephanie Hicks, she's an associate professor nowadays, also a statistician. Um, so they wrote this, uh, and Roger Peng, he wrote quite some articles about reproducible research, uh, and you'll see uh, at the bottoms of some slides, you'll see some references. Note that the pictures that I've used in this presentation, you can see them in the notes. So if you download the, the, the LibreOffice file, uh, you can see in the notes, you can see where I got these pictures from. So the paper in one slide overview, it starts that computational experiments are complex and it looks at the current state and the past state a bit and the path forward. It makes um, some uh, big it, 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 um, there, there's some effort in defining what reproducibility and replicability are. So reproducibility is to recreate the results from a same experiment by a different anal analyst. And for that the code and the data must be available. Whereas replicability, that's maybe from a scientific point of view even more interesting. That's when you reconclude the same conclusion uh, based on different data, let's say different uh, populations, different nature reserves, different experiments at different locations with different cell lines, those kind of things. So in the end, replicability is, is more is interesting at the bigger point of view, and reproducibility is more like the foundation of it. And also, having reproducible science allows easier replicability. So in the introduction, I'll I will use three examples that they put there himself, uh, themselves. And here we have uh, John Klarbaut. And he is uh, he was one of the first uh, who cared about reproducible science. And he wrote down that it often seems that the greatest beneficiary of preparing the work in a reproducible form is the original author. And here he mentioned that when we as scientists do our analysis, when they are too complex, we f tend to forget what we did in all those steps. And he says that especially when you as when you just wrote or published your paper, you'll benefit most yourself if you want to redo it or extend the analysis. Also, you know exactly what you did only then. Well, Klarbaut, so, so this, this citation is a bit older than in, um, uh, it's a bit older, although he was definitely the inspiration of the next two persons, uh, which are John Bucky, this is also John but spelled differently, and Dave De Noho. And they were heavily inspired by uh, this guy Clarebout. They claim that, and I cite here from them, <coughs> an article is a merely advertising of scholarship. The actual scholarship is the complete software development environment 
and the complete set of instructions which generated the figures. And you can see where they come from. They were very ambitious. They think it's very important to, 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 to reproduce their own work. So they published a piece of software called WaveLab. Uh, I don't know exactly what it does. That's also unimportant. But it allows everyone to reproduce their results themselves as well as tweak around with the parameters yourself. So they, they really, um, they were really into this reproducible thing. And the third more recent example of reproducible research is, um, is about hydroxychloroquine. So in the at the start of the pandemic, there was an article published in the Lancet here. You can read the retraction because it's retracted. And the reason why this was retracted is because the data was not available. So the, the person that, uh, or the entity, I should say, the corporation that had the data didn't allow all the researchers to, um, here it says, our reviews were not able to conduct an independent and private peer review and therefore notify us of their withdrawal from the peer review process. And that retracted article stated that hydrochloroquine was not useful in combating uh, COVID. And I think that this is the consensus at the moment. So although they were right, if my memory is correct, um, they were retracted just because the data was not accessible. And you could argue, and it was argued that in the pandemic to make decisions, it is important to be able to do this. It's too important to do it, uh, to do a, a proper review, that the reviews just declined because they didn't want to have it wrong and, 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 and be wrong by ex assuming this is all nice and dandy. So that's a more recent example where people care about reproducible science. So in the next paragraph they define reproducible research and this is a quote from Roger Pank 10 years ago and he wrote a published data analysis is reproducible if the analytic data sets, I made this in red because they, they explain it a bit more, and the computer code used to create the data analysis are made available to others for independent study and analysis. So in the, in the current paper, 10 years later, less than this uh, last year, they, they, they wonder like what, what is exactly meant by all of this. So one of the things he claims that if you have a data set you only need to, so, so let's say you have a very big data set, let's say you've measured more than needed for a publication. Then they say it's okay to only publish the subset of the data needed for that publication. So let's say I measure 100 variables and I, uh, and I only used five for my reproducible research, then I can only publish those five. Uh, uh, the, those five variables. This is a problem I will come back to later, but there are, there are multiple things that I want to want to think about with you. That's why this is question mark in the journal club. I ask my team members to, um, to, to, to have their own ideas about it. I can't do this in a video, obviously. Also the computer code. Uh, with the computer code, he means all the scripts, for example, R scripts or Python scripts used in the analysis, but also in the visualization. And I think that's a very good idea because the analysis, of course, we can see what they did exactly. And it's the code that, that the, did the actual research, and uh, not the English paper. So if the two disagree, it's a code that did the actual work. So the code is right. So you can just analyze the primary source of information. But the visualization is also important. So it may take some time to nicely visualize your results, but you can make errors there as well. And also when someone visualizes stuff, I enjoy to, to make sure that there are no outliers being removed accidentally or on purpose. It's too easy in ggplot2, for example, it's an R package for plotting to do that. One other thing that's also part of the computer code are the tuning parameters. So in the paper they mention a research using uh, artificial intelligence, neural networks to investigate and predict if a person has breast cancer from pictures 
And obviously the, 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 the software did better than experts. But sadly it could not be reproduced because the tuning parameters are too sensitive. Um, so in that case, due to the absence of the tuning parameters, it could not be reproduced. So like now I would ask my group members to, to have their own ideas, but I'll dis now just start discussing what I think is uh, missing. Of course, a paper only has a certain length, so but I feel that there are some missing opportunities here already. So, so using the data, that's all, all nice to supply it, but what when you have sensitive data? So does this mean that sensitive data is never and if, if you work on sensitive data, you can never have reproducible science. I disagree with that to some extent. And for example, what about making pu public your testing data set? So that's a data set you've used to test on. Um, that should be public. It can be fake and artificial or simulated or whatever. I in that way, we have at least a data set to see what's going on, what the code is doing and we can use other programs on that same data set to see if they give similar results or not and we find bugs in that way and um, it's about reproducible research at least if we can reproduce a testing data set that should do the same as the sensitive data set I think this is close to a gold standard as well also so the code should be available but, but there's no guideline on how to make it available for example there are some papers that say and I quote the code is available by sending an email to the author upon reasonable request." End quote. That is a way to do it. And I'm not sure if you've ever done this, but you don't always get a reply back. Additionally, you can paste your code in a supplementary material. And that is already uh, better, but there's no guarantee it will work. And that Actually, the pasted code is free of typos or it matches the, the, the English of the article. Um, but you can post it on GitHub, for example, or post it on in a working singularity container. But I'll go back to that later. Also, whatever that code is, in which form it is published, is there any requirements for it? So let's say I put the code in, um, in my supplementary materials. Is, is, is it everything goes? Or, or are there certain guidelines that should be followed before we have the idea that indeed the results are reproducible? Should we review that code? So those are, those are some things I felt missing there. Um, and of course, the, uh, Roger only focused on the primary things, that's all fine. I, I've just hoped or I'd have enjoyed to see more of this. So in the paper, they spoke about reproducible and replicable research and I took a paper from uh, Prasad et al, where Roger is also um, an author of and reproducible research is when on the same data and the same code but by a different person running the code it should give the same results so, th so that's what this means here we have the analyst he has the same code because black is the same if we have a different analysis analyst using the same data and the same code, he should have exactly this, he or she should have the same results. And, and replicable is more interesting from a scientific point of view, that if we have a different experimenter that has different data and then run the same code, that you have similar results. So let's imagine that we are looking for, um, you can do anything here, so let's assume we are looking for an association between uh, some kind of genetic uh, effect. So we have some, some genotypes of people, population studies, and we expect there be an association between a certain genotype and a certain phenotype, let's say a disease or how someone looks like or what protein levels in the blood. Then doing using different populations and using the same or different data and giving similar results means that that association is likelier to be true. It's not an effect of just that population or by chance or by p-value hacking or whatever. We know this knowledge is more likely to be true in general. And this is from a scientific point of view, this is the more interesting one. Although reproducibility will help to do this and also reproducibility may be um, a prerequisite for replicable science.
but we, we, we could debate about that. So in the old paper, um, Roger, Professor Pang, he published this figure and he calls it the reproducibility spectrum. And also in this paper, he makes this claim that if you have a publication only that does not um, has the code with it, it's, it's not reproducible. Whereas if the publication has code, it's more reproducible. If it has code and data, more linked and executable code and data, more reproducible. And that should be the golden standard. So upon first glance, I think this is a this is a nice figure. In the end, I think there's something wrong with it. I think we can make this figure superior and update it. But I'll do that later on. So usually I would ask you, what, what do you think is wrong with this figure? But uh, well, it's a video. So one thing I want to highlight is there's a section about forensic bioinformatics in which they, there was a group, uh, Baggerly et al, in which they took a look at some code and tried to reproduce it. And first I will zoom in on the full, uh, on a subset of the picture. This is the full picture, don't look at it, this is the zoom in. So I'll, I'll highlight one of those by Potty et al. And um, in the paper they claim that they were, ab they were able to prove that they were able to reproduce the same mistakes and there were multiple of those mistake research that they replicated uh, by adding the error themselves and also apparently this broke the career of potty i'm not sure about that and i'm not sure about the state of it anymore but um, i'm just going to explain what they found so did they so they did um, uh, um, an rna expression um, experiment. Um, I'm not going to go into details of the biology here, but um, that, so the, the big main thing table is expression level for different cell lines and for different expression products, let's say R, uh, messenger RNA. And um, at the top there were, you have three, uh, blue and, and red lines, which means that the, that the cell line is either resistant or sensitive to an antibiotics and they cluster the, 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 the expression levels in a cladogram, which is the least interesting part here, but they put it there. So now we go take a look. So what you expect is that all these expression levels, they, they can never be completely the same for different cell lines for all products. But that is what they found. So this is a paper that was not published by uh, Potty et al. When they did research, it was redone by Baggerly, including all the mistakes. And then you see, for example, multiple cell lines. So this is maybe one, two, three, four. I, it's hard to see. Let's assume four here. There were four cell lines that had exactly the same expression profile. And what is most peculiar is of these four, one of them was sensitive and the other three were insensitive to a certain antibiotic. Um, uh, so that's obviously a mistake. You can't have exactly the same expression for once. To, it's weird if you have the same expression and then you are the older than the others. That is, you are sensitive while all the others are not, or the other way around. And the, in the general paper, so this was caused by off by one error. And in the general paper, where they investigated more of these um, studies. They found that the most common errors are simple. And they also found that simple errors are common. So that's not very. Um, enjoyable to read, uh, but it's, uh, that's what they found. So in the paper they give, uh, they, they, they take a look at, at how it's going now with data and code, but I still think a third aspect is missing in reproducible science. But let's go through what um, Roger and, uh, what, what Roger thought. So for example the data, so he noted uh, that data is more commonly shared nowadays. I think that's true. And big data sets are and can be uploaded. Yeah, and that's also true, I think, because we have now Data Dryad and Zenodo, we have GitHub, those kind of things. So that is good. He noticed that stripping data from the original context may be problematic, and I agree with that. Um, one thing is, let's say, for example, you're an ecologist and you go to two different natural reserves and you measure hundreds of variables, then of course you'll find significant results. Uh, let's assume that both the variables are s 
distributed equally over the two environments and completely random there's no effect there's no difference between them just by chance then if you measure a hundred variables and for a significance level of five percent you'll find five variables by chance that are that differ just by chance and if you only publish those five variables then it's not seen people cannot observe you've been selectively picking your results for significance also called a p-value hacking or harking uh, hypothesis after results are known so that's a bit problematic i would say and he acknowledges that and also what he sees is that there are best practices emerging in sharing the data for example, by making the data tidy so tidy data it's an idea from the tidyverse which is an r set of package like a set of packages in the r programming language popularized by Hedley wickham and we see more and more tidy data and uh, i think that's very it makes it easier to reuse data about the code he says that the software development has become easier with and he talks about higher level languages like r and python and indeed it's easier to put code in packages that's definitely the case for r and python and there's an increase of testing and test-based development so what i don't understand is why he used test-based development instead of test-driven development i think that's the more commonly used term but that can be me also i'm not completely sure if i agree with software development has become easier i feel it's easier to make a computer do something for example in r r always does something when you make it when you feed it some code but it's those languages like r and python they are type uh, they are not strongly typed languages so it's easy to make it do something but it's hard to make sure they do it they do the correct thing uh, so that's countered by testing and test driven development i understand but i'm not sure if software development has become easier i think it's easier to start i think it's easier to write some code that does something but i'm unsure if this is what you uh, i'm unsure if you want that sloppiness in your code as as, as us academics so what i was missing um, and now I've added some more things so for example for data again what what do we do with sensitive data so there are two developments here that are interesting which are homomorphic algorithms that allows you to work on encrypted data sets so you can't see the real data so you can't see the sensitive data but you can get your summary statistics out of them I'm not sure exactly how this works how far this is but that's an interesting development as well as sending code to the data so Let's take the UK Biobank, which is a genetic database that has, what is it, 500,000 Britons, uh, people from the United Kingdom, they're the genotype and phenotype. Um, if you could just send your code to a web server and that web server then runs it securely, of course it has to make sure not to de-identify or not to identify people. Um, that's also cool. That allows us to work with sensitive data. But what I still miss is the testing data set and the benchmark data set. So if we work with sensitive data, why don't we just publish a fake data set we used in testing? So at least people can experiment and see uh, what our code did exactly. And then they can modify the testing data and, and, and see uh, to verify their hypothesis, how our code works. Also some kind of benchmark data set that must be publicly available would be useful to compare different types of software with one another. So I would love to read more about that. Also the code. So what uh, again he's missing is like how to make code available. Like should it be like a, a remark in your paper that the the code is re is available upon reasonable request by sending an email to the author? Or shouldn't it be uh, on, on GitHub or on a, it should be in the supplementary material? Maybe it should be even supplied as a runnable container, let's say a Docker container or a Singularity container. That would definitely make it more reproducible. And I would love to have seen mention of that because if you have, a, let's say, a Singularity container, you can put your code in there and the environment and make it ru make run make your experiment run from one line of code and uh, that's truly reproducible also the requirements for the code like if anything goes then maybe we feel in our code review that it's not likely to be correct 
And one thing to alleviate that is that maybe putting it on GitHub, add continuous integration tests. Those are tests that are run when you submit a new version of your code. And those tests can check, for example, if the code really builds, like if it can be put into an R package, for example. Um, and then it can also run tests. And maybe we should have a certain amount of code being covered by test, also called the code coverage. Um, because these things, we know they will improve the quality of code and the correctness of code. So maybe we should also do that. But first step is indeed make the code available. And I completely agree with uh, Roger there. So the thing I completely missed in reproducible science is the paper. Um, so yes, we have the data. Yes, we have the code, but the paper is very important. Um, maybe not for reproducibility. Uh, maybe so that's why I see the point there a bit because reproducibility means redoing the same analysis again with the same code and the same data should return uh, should return the same results but the, the 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 paper can also be put online and um in that way so, so pre registration for example is a is a way to make sure that our research is replicable. So that should be called refining replicability. So it's beyond the scope of the paper. But if we would do pre-registration, then we would have a cleaner scientific process. So let's take a look. So let's go a bit in depth here. And we can keep the paper, we can treat paper as code, as in the text from our paper, we can treat as code. So it can keep a history, for example, on GitHub. So let's go a bit into detail. So this is pre-registration where you design your study and before collecting the data you get your paper already reviewed so in that way you can write down that what your hypothesis is what you're going to do how you're going to analyze it and how you're going to draw your conclusions and after this peer review and some journals say well if you do this whatever comes out of it will publish your results after peer review then you actually do it and in that way we get reproducible or replicable science i should say because it's there's no such there there have been less opportunity for biases that we as scientists inherently put in for example now I go back to the scientific process so this is the scientific process in which we, for example, generate and specify hypothesis, we design a study, we collect our data, we analyze the data, we interpret it and we publish. So that's the idea of the hypothetical deductical model. But what happens is that sometimes we have our data and then we think, oh, that fits this hypothesis very well. And then we write down the hypothesis as if we started with that hypothesis. And this results also in a lack of replication. So that's why I put it in. Um, yeah, it, re it reduces the replicability of our study. So in the ultimate goal, this would be uh, also good. This is another facet. It's, yeah, but it's beyond the scope of the paper. Also p-value hacking, we can remove that. All right, so let's go to, um, to, this pa to this table from Roger. And this is what I feel the reproductibility spectrum should look like. So when you have a pa publication only, it's not reproducible. But I feel that we should co put code on one axis and data on the other for to determine the reproducibility of a research. So if people only paste their raw code, let's say in a supplementary material, then whatever you do, there's no guarantee this raw code will actually work. So I would say replicability is low. But if you put our hosted code on GitHub and add tests on it, then it's already medium. And also if you provide vulnerable code, let's say a singularity container, then the replicability is maybe high to medium. But would we run that code on testing data instead of the actual, let's say, sensitive data, then already reproducibility is way higher. So if we would actually publish testing data and actual data if we can, that's the same replicability, I would say. So I would say that what what Roger published 10 years ago, yes, that's a good first step, but I think that code and data are different components and they should be separated.
Well, so in the journal club, we um, we discussed this paper a bit, and this is what comes out of it. So one claim was that reproducible research takes more time, which is unaccounted for. And uh, yeah, indeed, there was um, yeah also the administrative burden of reproducible research is not given enough attention. Um, we I think there's no. I'm, I'm unsure if there's any research about that. Definitely, it, it there's no glory in it. Oh, that's here. That's here. There is no incentive to do reproducible research. We know this is increasing, but indeed, there's no glory given to doing so. Um, if it takes extra time, I don't know because following good practice and like test-driven development is known um, to speed up development. And if you don't test, you can say, well, that's quicker, but that's false. Um, but for a for a layman, that 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 is an argumentation you can take there. Also, there's was the idea that reproducible research limits creativity, and we know this is what I've known about is that this may not be completely true, um, because there was this article by Söderberg et al. also last year that they scored registered reports that are papers that were pre-registered. And they used a double blind test and they compared registered reports compared to regular papers. And they just, the author didn't, the reader didn't know what type of paper it was. They had to score this on multiple criteria, apparently 19. And creativity was not significantly lower or higher on the pre, on the registered reports. And, uh, and yeah, so, so there's no, so maybe it limits the creativity when doing the experiment, but in the paper you can't see that back. There was also an idea, uh, what we discussed, is what happens to the copyright when your code is reused to make a figure on other data. So I put in a lot of effort, so imagine you put in a lot of effort to make beautiful figures from your results or from your data, and someone else then uses that code on different data and publishes that figure. Should or must the author be attributed on that figure? And does a software license protect or help? The answer is we, we don't know. Look, I assume that uh, if your software license, your own software license that made the, the figure, um, usually has in it that you must attribute the author, that it's called by, that you attribute uh, the person. But if you create a figure using it, so well, yeah, you should mention the figure, I think, the, the, the original software to make the figure somewhere, but maybe not on the figure. Uh, so we don't know, and we don't know if the, the, the software license helps. All right, so this was the Journal Club discussion again, um, where we discussed this paper by Roger and Stephanie. I mostly spoke about Roger, because instead of Stephanie, I mentioned her not often enough, although she wrote the paper as well, but because Roger was in so many more papers, I, I, meant, I usually spoke about Roger. So if you're Stephanie, I'm sorry. Um, but that means that um, I've redone the Journal Club discussion. I hope you think something of it or enjoy it or whatever, and I wish you a very good day. Bye.